Welcome to the Pleasant Green Missionary Baptist Church Sunday School Lesson for Sunday, April 16th, 2023. I am Deacon Barry Taylor and I will be your presenter today. We are still in Unit 2 from the Faith Pathway Adult Quarterly Spring uh, Quarter uh, Lessons and it's entitled Experiencing the Resurrection. Unit 2 is entitled Experiencing the Resurrection. We're in Lesson 7, which is entitled Friends, Food, and Fellowship. Our devotional reading is taken from Psalms, actually is Psalms 30. Our background scripture is taken from the Gospel of John, chapter 21, verses 1 to 14. That is also our printed or lesson passage John chapter 21 verses 1 to 14 our key verse from the King James Version is Jesus saith unto them come and dine and none of the disciples durst ask him who art thou knowing that it was the Lord that is John chapter 21 and verse 12 our lesson aims from the quarterly or number one discern the meaning of recognizing Jesus only after he's, he says or does something familiar to his followers. Number two, awaken to Jesus' healing power in your own life. And then number two, three rather, restate your sense of purpose in light of the spiritual nourishment and sustenance that Jesus offers. After the introduction, our lesson has two divisions. Our lesson outline has two divisions. The first is entitled Toiling in Vain. Toiling in Vain. And that's covered between John chapter 21 verses 1 and 6. Verses 1 to 6. The second division is entitled A Renewed Fellowship. That's covered between John 21, verses 7 and 14. From the Standard Commentary, the lesson title is Jesus Cooks Breakfast. Jesus Cooks Breakfast and additional aims are, number one, list key points of the disciples' third encounter with the resurrected Christ. Number two, provide reasons as to why the disciples did or did not recognize Jesus. And then number three, write a prayer asking for eyes that recognize Jesus at work this week. Before we um, just give a little background on the lesson, let's go before the throne. Our Father, we do thank and praise you lord always for your loving kindness and your tender mercies we thank you for another opportunity to study your word and we thank you lord for uh, what you have revealed to us through your word lord concerning the death and resurrection of our lord jesus christ lord we pray as we study uh, your word that you give us the clear understanding lord and that you would help us to realize that uh, that you are faithful, Lord, and that, Lord Jesus, you're, you're ever present with us, Lord. You are our sustenance. You are our provision. Uh, we know that, uh, with that, that everything that we need and everything that we desire that is uh, consistent with your will, you will provide. We thank you, Lord, for every good and perfect gift, and we ask that you would bless uh, every person uh, hearing this lesson and every household represented. In Jesus' name, amen. So uh, we are um, in the Gospel of John, which um, we know gives uh, a slightly different account of the, uh, uh, the appearances of Jesus uh, following uh, his resurrection. Uh, and actually, when he... Uh, speaks of this being the third appearance of Jesus. It is according to John's gospel. 
Um, we know that uh, this gospel was written by John, despite the fact that he does not name himself as the author, simply refers to himself as the disciple that Jesus loved. And some of the commentators that you uh, may read will suggest that uh, chapter 21 of this gospel seems to have been added uh, and perhaps by someone other than John, maybe a scribe, uh, shortly after, because there is a natural, or appears to be a natural conclusion of the gospel in chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. And if you go back to chapter 20, uh, beginning at verse uh, 26 you read where Jesus appears after eight days after his first appearance and Thomas to the disciples and Thomas is with the disciples and of course Thomas is asked to place his uh, fingers in the print of the nails in his hands and thrust his fist into his side and then of course Thomas confesses my Lord and my God and Jesus um, tells him uh, he said uh, in verse 29, Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. We said a little bit about this last week uh, during our lesson. Uh, we have not seen the resurrected Christ, but we believe that he has been resurrected by faith. And we believe in his word and the word of the gospel that he has that he was bodily resurrected. And then he goes on in verse 30 and 31 and again gives what appears to be the natural conclusion to the whole gospel and says, And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book, but these are written that ye may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name and that is eternal life in his name now the reason some commentators suspect that 21 was added later and it was soon after uh, 20 was written because there's no record that this gospel was ever distributed without chapter 21 is because the writing style is a bit different than the first 20 chapters there's a perception apparently of different uh, in a different language style and content compared to the rest of the gospel but be that as it may if it was added by a scribe or uh, someone uh, they are recollections of John uh, and uh, uh, we're going to take them as as a part as a completion of the Gospel of John and actually they were uh, it was perhaps added to clean up some open uh, items that uh, were not addressed uh, in the rest of the gospel uh, there were actually five I know the adult quarterly commentator says that there were four but MacArthur says there were five uh, items to be uh, addressed by this we'll call it an epilogue the first was the question of whether Jesus would uh, continue to provide uh, uh, for his own uh, and we see that uh, in verse uh, 2017 there was that question whether he was going to not being in their presence whether he was going to continue to provide for his own number two what happened to Peter we know that Peter had denied Christ three times and fled uh, during his trial and the last time we saw him uh, uh, Peter had to run to the grave site and saw the empty tomb that's in uh, chapter 20 verses 6 to 8 so we needed to know there needed to be some closure on uh, what happened to Peter number three third question is what about the future of the disciples uh, now that they were without their master now Jesus had given them some general instructions but they had not received 
specific marching orders and had not received at this point the Holy Spirit who would empower them to accomplish uh, what the Lord Jesus had told them they would be now fishers of men not fishers of fish and by the way that's answered in uh, John 21 verses 18 and 19 beyond our lesson text the fourth question uh, was John going to die now as you read further beyond our lesson text you see where Jesus is asked by Peter what about this man referring to John and Jesus says hey if I if I will that he, he he tarries and lives until I return what is that to you and because of that saying it was uh, believed that John would not die well at this point John may have died and there was some confusion about what Jesus had said so that needed to be cleared up and it's cleared up in chapter 21 the fact that Jesus did not say that he wouldn't die he said that if he willed that he not then what is that to you and then the fifth um, question was uh, why weren't other things that Jesus did recorded by John by his uh, gospel the first 20 chapters at least and we see that in the conclusion that that question answered in the conclusion of chapter 21 verses 24 and 25 this is the disciple who testifies of these things and wrote these things and we know that his testimony is true that's speaking of John and there are also many other things that Jesus did which if it were written one by one I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written amen so there was so much that Jesus did and said that uh, it was just too much to, to write uh, now um, having given that as background we're going to get into our our lesson uh, we're going to read the first uh, passage uh, from the first division again of the, the quarterly which is entitled toiling in vain uh, I'm going to read from the King James Version uh, today. <clears throat> so beginning at verse 1, reading through 6. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And on this wise showed he himself. Verse 2. There were together Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus and Nathaniel of Canaan and Galilee and the sons of Zebedee, and two other of his disciples. Simon Peter said unto them, I go a fishing. They said unto him, We also go with you. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately, and that night they caught nothing. Verse 4. But when the morning was come, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said unto them, Children, have you any meat? They answered him, No. Verse 6. And he said unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. They cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fish, fishes. Let's back up to verse 1. <clears throat> After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias on this wise showed he himself. And actually, maybe it's a little, a little clearer in the NIV. It says, afterwards, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. Uh, the Sea of Tiberias was another name for the Sea or Lake of Galilee. It happened this way. Now, um, what thing, when you, when, you, when you read after these things, what things are we talking about? Well, the things that uh, were spoken of in chapter 20, uh, more specifically, uh, and uh, I think that's, that's, that's what we are ref what being referred to here. Uh, then uh, he says, he showed or manifested himself okay or made himself uh, uh, made an appearance if you will uh, and it says uh, and this is the way he did it 
verse 1 says, and it gives an account following of how he manifests or showed himself to uh, his disciples. Verse 2, uh, and we're going to break this down very quickly. Part A says, there were together Simon Peter, and of course John refers to him by both names is uh, Simon and Peter and perhaps uh, remembering uh, that the Lord Jesus had so named him uh, Peter or the rock based on his confession in Matthew chapter 16 verse 18 uh, part B and Thomas called Didymus or the twin Thomas means a twin in Greek or as Didymus is uh, the Greek uh, phrase and it means twin and then um, I'm sorry Ara Thomas is Aramaic Didymus is Greek and uh, we remember Thomas of course Thomas was the doubting Thomas the one that Jesus had appeared to uh, all, uh, eight days after his resurrection and uh, he confessed after seeing Jesus that he was Lord Part C, and Nathaniel of Canaan in Galilee. Um, now, one of the commentators thinks that this Nathaniel may have also been the disciple or the apostle Bartholomew. Um, and because um, he was not mentioned uh, as a an apostle in Matthew chapter 10 verses 2 to 4 rather Bartholomew was part D and the sons of Zebedee we know who they were John and his brother James who were part of the inner circle along with Peter Simon Peter of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, they were also called the Bonerges or the sons of thunder and while Jesus, I mean, sorry, John refers to himself as <clears throat> the disciple that Jesus loved, uh, there should be no confusion about whether that was James or John in this case, because by the time this gospel was written, James had been, uh, had been slain. He'd been martyred, as you may remember, by Herod. And we see that in Acts chapter 12, verses 1 to 2. And that was in A.D. 44. Uh, this uh, gospel was written when John was old, uh, uh, perhaps A.D. Uh, well, he, he was, it was much later. And then uh, finally, and two other disciples, they're not named, but it's suspected uh, that they are Andrew and Philip. References made to Matthew chapter 10 verses 2 to 4. They were both uh, from Galilee and of course they were both fishermen as well. So likely the other two disciples were Andrew and Philip. Verse 3 reads, Simon Peter saith unto them, I go a fishing. They said unto him, We also go with thee. They, <clears throat> excuse me, they went forth and entered into a ship or a boat. Actually, it was a small boat immediately, and that night they caught nothing. Now, <clears throat> there's been a lot of criticism of, of Simon Peter. Um, commentators have suggested that he was going back to his old lifestyle uh, and not um, fulfilling the mission uh, that Christ had for his apostles uh, and, and both commentators that I read in preparation for presenting suggest that that criticism is perhaps unfair uh, now in obedience to what the Lord Jesus had commanded his disciples to do they have gone to Galilee to meet him and they are waiting for Jesus to appear to them at Galilee uh, this was a again uh, the former former livelihood fishing was a former livelihood they did not know exactly when Jesus was going to appear and uh, rather than just twiddle their thumbs and wait on them it was not inappropriate for them to 
to pass the time of, by doing something gainful and going to uh, to to fish. Now, um, having said that, uh, again, uh, perhaps some arguments can be made why they didn't wait patiently, specifically at the location where Jesus told them to. But uh, again, um, I don't think that criticism is warranted myself because they decide to go fishing while they wait on the Lord. Now, the, as you may or may not know, uh, the what was traditional and customary was for fishermen to fish, commercial fishermen to fish with large nets, and they actually fished at night when the water, surface water was cooler. The fish would come up closer to the surface and be ensnared in the nets and of course they're all night trying to do this and so it's morning now it's morning sun's rising surface water is beginning to heat up and they have caught nothing the verse 4 reads but when the morning was now come jesus stood on the shore but the disciples knew him not so Jesus is on the shore, and we'll see in a minute, <clears throat> at a distance, uh, they can see him. Uh, he's about 300 feet or 100 yards away. And um, it, he, it says here, but the disciples knew not that it was him. They did not recognize him. Now, there are a couple of reasons you could speculate as to why they didn't recognize him. At this point, he was 100 yards away. I mean, I, I couldn't recognize, I'm sure, someone that was 300 feet away or 100 yards away, um, even with my contact lenses. Um, but as we'll see later, uh, what's suggested during uh, the breakfast is that um, he looks apparently different they know that it's him uh, because of uh, what he's saying and his mannerism and so forth, but uh, he apparently uh, looks different from the pre-resurrection uh, Christ, uh, resurrected Christ, if you will. And it's suspected that Jesus, for some reason, has changed his appearance or is making himself look a little different uh, to his disciples, the same as he did uh, with the disciples that he walked along beside uh, on the road to Emmaus and then revealed himself or made himself uh, recognizable at the breaking of bread uh, at dinner. But at this point, 300 feet away, you know, it's the break of dawn, you know, may have been some lighting issues and so forth. They did not recognize him. Verse 5, Then Jesus said unto them, Children, have you any meat? They answered, no. Now, this is verses phrased uh, differently from the NIV, which says, he called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. Okay, the word translated children in the NIV uh, is um, Greco, it's from Greco-Roman literature uh, and it's used in the context of education. It was a term of endearment uh, from teachers to students that communicated affection uh, deeper than merely collegiality. Uh, and so Jesus chose that word and in choosing it he positioned himself as a benevolent authority over the disciples and a caring mentor. So there's a lot more in the term children than friend. Okay, so I prefer the King James uh, use of the word children. He refers to them as children, which puts himself into a kind of authoritative position over them, benevolent authoritative position. And he says, have you any meat? And of course, that's food or fish in this context. He's He's asking if they have any fish, and they answer him, no. Verse 6, And he said unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. They cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it 
for the multitude of fishes. Now, um, we uh, we notice the one thing we notice uh, that even though these are experienced commercial fishermen, they don't challenge this stranger who's shouting to them from the shore instructions as to what to do. Uh, and there's obviously an authoritative uh, tone uh, and uh, but also I think they recount uh, what happened as recorded in Luke chapter 5 verses 1 to 11 where uh, there was a similar situation where Jesus instructs uh, them uh, Peter and others to cast the net, to go out and, 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 and instruct them as to how to find fish. And they, and they find an abundant of fish, so they don't, uh, they learn not to second guess, if you will, uh, someone that's uh, with some tone of authority instructing them as to what to do. So these experienced fishermen don't question, they simply obey, and that's interesting to see. So they cast the net on the right side of the sea. Now they know in the back of their mind, they say, well, this doesn't make sense, you know, because the waters, the surface water is heated up, the fish have gone deep, our nets are not big enough or deep enough to catch the fish down there. So uh, in their, logically they're saying, this doesn't make sense. We know we're commercial fishermen. No commercial fisherman in his right mind would be out here trying to fish in the day. So to their amazement, uh, they catch up an abundance of fish, so many that the net, uh, they're amazed that the net is able to even hold these fish. Now we're going to move into our, actually there's a question before we move into our second division, which reads, what spiritual disciplines enable believers to remain in God's will for their lives? What spiritual discipline? I think, I mean, certainly studying God's word, uh, praying in the spirit to the extent we're able to be guided by the spirit in our prayers. And then uh, occasionally fasting to focus us on the spiritual uh, rather than uh, to focus us more on the spiritual. So let's move into our second division, which is entitled <clears throat> A Renewed Fellowship. That's covered between John 21, verses 7 to 14. And let's read uh, that passage from the KJV. And it reads, Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved said unto him, said unto rather Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girded his fisher's coat onto him, for he was naked, in parentheses, and did cast himself into the sea. Verse 8. And the other disciples came in the little ship or boat, for they were not far from the land, but as it were two hundred cubits, dragging the net with fishes. As soon as they were come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid thereon, and bread. Verse 10, Jesus said unto them, Bring of the fish which you have now caught. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of great fishes, a hundred and fifty and three, or a hundred and fifty-three. And for all there were no, so many fish, so many rather, yet was the net was not the net broken. Verse 12, Jesus said unto them, Come and dine. And none of the disciples durst ask him, Who art thou, knowing that it was the Lord? Jesus then cometh and taketh bread and giveth them, and fish likewise. Verse 14, This is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples, after that, he was risen from the dead. So let's back up to verse 7, which reads, Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved, and that, of course, is John, 
said unto Peter, it is the Lord. Now John seems to have a bit more faith uh, or sees through the eyes of faith, I think, a little more than some of the others at this point. He did uh, when he saw the clothing and the tomb and the way they were arranged, believed that Jesus had risen from the dead. And uh, it says, now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girded on his fisher's uh, coat or his outer garment, for he was naked and it was customary for uh, the fishers to fish naked uh, in the heat and uh, and they had to some occasionally dive in the water to get one end or the other of the net and pull it together so uh, they were typically naked or, or maybe perhaps had uh, uh, something uh, very very uh, modest on um, and uh, of course it was not uh, he was going to uh, meet the Lord, so it was not appropriate for him to go there naked, obviously. So he cast on his outer garment and he cast himself into the sea. Now, you have to wonder uh, why Peter is so anxious to see the one that he had denied three times and wept bitterly, but he is really anxious uh, and appears more anxious than the others to see his Lord. So he, and, and we'll find out in a minute, he's about a hundred yards out, and that's not a you know that's not a long swim, but uh, he's he's anxious to get there, and he's uh, gonna beat the beat the small boat there. Verse eight says, and the other disciples came in the little ship. Or actually, it was a boat, uh, for they were not far from land, as it were two hundred cubits. And again, that's uh, a cubit is eighteen inches. Two cubits would be a yard, so it's like a uh, hundred yards or three hundred feet dragging the net of fishes so they are it's taking them a little more time to get there they're just struggling if you will to row this boat to shore dragging all these fish verse 9 says as soon as they were come to land they saw a fire of coals there and fish laid there on and bread so the Lord Jesus has provided a meal for them uh, there's no explanation as to where he got the fish, but we know when he fed the 5,000 men plus women and children and the 4,000 plus women and children, there was no uh, question about his ability to miraculously provide food for them and anything else that they needed. And that's one of the things that is to be demonstrated here, that the Lord... Uh, I certainly was able to provide for their physical need, their physical sustenance, but also their spiritual need as well. We'll say a little bit more about that in a, in a few minutes. So he's got this the, the fish broiling, and, and and these guys are no doubt hungry. They've toiled all night and bread. Verse 10 says, Jesus saith unto them, Bring of the fish which ye have now caught. So Jesus wanted to also celebrate the miraculous uh, bounty which they had just hauled in, or the, the bounty they had hauled in miraculously, which he had also provided, by the way. And uh, we see that uh, verse uh, 11 says, uh, so Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of great fishes a hundred and fifty and three and for all there were so many yet was the net not broken now um, one of the commentators suggested Peter drew the net in by himself I'm not sure that that's what's meant he certainly went and helped to draw the net in um, and um, the fact that there were 153 mentioned precisely suggests a couple of things. Number one, uh, there was an eyewitness. Somebody, John was an eyewitness who was the author here. Uh, and he either, again, if he did not write chapter 21 himself, he certainly conveyed his eyewitness testimony to a scribe or whoever did write it if it was not him. Now, it uh, t tested the fact that he was an eyewitness because there's an exact count of fish. 
it was not uncommon for fishermen to count their haul so they could divide the haul equally for marketing purposes or for selling purposes. And then the, the, the other um, uh, thing that comes to mind is I remember there were a certain number of fish that uh, they thought the nets uh, could hold, 140 some odd. I don't remember where I read that, but years ago I remember 140 something uh, and beyond that number, there was a specific number, and I guess this is irrespective of the size of the fish, the net was uh, not designed to hold anymore. It's like, you know, you can get fishing line, if you're uh, familiar with fishing, that uh, has test weights. It, it's designed to hold a fish of a certain weight or to, uh, to catch a fish of a certain weight, 10 pound, 8 pound, whatever, uh, test line. So the nets were not designed to hold the weight of 153 fish. So it was a, a miracle in itself that the net did not break. Which speaks of, again, the Lord's provision, his power to provide uh, abundantly, his, his, his power to provide abundantly, and his provision or his ability to make sure that uh, nothing is lost uh, in him getting uh, his blessings to us, his ability to deliver the blessings to us as he did his disciples. It's interesting that he's demonstrating the same power that he did when he first met uh, the disciples that some of whom will become apostles or those that will become apostles. Uh, he, he was consistent in demonstrating his ability to provide abundantly for them then. He's demonstrating that same ability to provide abundantly for them post-resurrection and so they can they should be assured that he will provide for all of their needs physical and spiritual we need to understand that uh, this fellowship uh, breakfast that he has invited them to is to share of course uh, in physical nourishment but also spiritual blessings he's going to give them uh, some more instructions and particularly Peter uh, Simon Peter, as we see in the in the verses just preceding or just following our lesson text today. Now, verse 12 reads, Jesus said unto them, Come and dine. And none of the disciples durst ask him, Who art thou, knowing that it was the Lord? From the NIV it reads, Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dare ask him, Who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Now, one of the commentators says, whenever Jesus ate with his disciples, they recognized him. And there are several examples here. Luke 24, 30 to 32, and then 40 to 43, and John 6, 35. Uh, of course, we read, uh, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. Uh, and then both the miracle of the fish and Jesus is sitting down to dine with his with these fishermen confirm Jesus's identity as the Lord now again I think for whatever reason the Lord uh, is withholding um, uh, or it has changed his appearance uh, so that he is not immediately recognized physically at least uh, as uh, the saint, as the, the person that he was pre-resurrection. In other words, there's some change in the physical features for what reason, I don't know, but they know because of uh, his, um, um, the way he actually interacts with them, uh, that it is definitely the Lord. And certainly they know by demonstration of his power over nature uh, and, 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 allow, and, 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 and allowing them to, helping them to catch this, this miraculous load of fish that it can be none other than the Lord. Verse 13 reads, Jesus then cometh and taketh bread and giveth to them 
and likewise the fish. Uh, it's not saint and not said here, but um, no doubt he asked the blessing as was his custom. He blessed the food before breaking the bread and giving them the bread and the fish as he had done customarily when uh, he was uh, on earth uh, during his earthly ministry, I should say. Now, we, we don't want to miss the uh, symbolism here, um, which... Uh, again was was explained more fully uh, earlier in uh, the Gospel of John uh, when you have a chance read uh, uh, John chapter 6 verses 26 to 40 uh, where uh, Jesus um, explains that he is the bread of life and of course the, the people said you know what sign do you show us and uh, they said Moses uh, gave us manna, our father's manna, and and and, and the in the desert, uh, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven. This is verse 30, 31. and 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 Jesus responds. He says, and Jesus said, most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my father. He says, gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he whom God, who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Jesus is the bread that gives life to the world. Then they said to him, verse 34, Lord, give us this bread always, 35. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. Now, they misunderstand uh, his further explaining how they are to eat his body and drink his blood. And he says, the words that I'm speaking unto you are spirit, in other words, and life and eternal life. So, in breaking this bread, Jesus is having fellowship with his disciples, one, the last fellowship with his disciples. The breaking of the bread again symbolizes him giving the sustenance, life uh, to the world. We're not speaking spiritual about physical life here, but spiritual life. He's giving them physical sustenance, of course, at this moment, but also spiritual life through his uh, body, okay, that hung on the cross. And finally, verse, <clears throat> verse 14 reads this is now the third time that jesus showed himself to his disciples after that he was risen from the dead again this uh this last verse or the last verse of our lesson text verse 14 is kind of works in tandem with uh the first verse 21 1 which says i mean they're kind of bookends it says you know uh the lord jesus appeared uh, to his disciples and this is how he appeared so what we read between verses 2 and 13 is the account of his appearance to his disciples post-resurrection and again this is the third appearance recorded by John the other appearances are recorded in John chapter 20 verse 19 to 23 and uh, the second was, that was the first, and the second was John chapter 20, verses 26 to 29. And again, that was when he uh, came back eight days after his first appearance, uh, ostensibly for purposes of showing himself to Thomas and telling Thomas, scolding him, if you will, for his uh, not believing, even though he had not seen him in the flesh. Now we, we, we also want to uh, just just be reminded that uh, this again Jesus is uh, has res has been resurrected from the dead. Now he's got a spiritual body. He's able to eat food, and we know he's able to appear and to disappear at will and different various places. And he is about to uh, finish the preparation, preparing his disciples for the work. Uh, he's going to leave for them to do. Uh, you can pick this up in uh, Acts chapter 1, verses 1 to 8. But immediately following our lesson text, 
uh, he restores Peter. Uh, Peter, no doubt, is still uh, smarting from uh, his um, uh, his uh, disowning, if you will, or uh, uh, the Lord Jesus, or denying uh, any connection with the Lord Jesus during his trial. So uh, the Lord restores him and instructs him to feed. He asks him if he loves him. If we read on uh, beyond, again, our lesson text, uh, verses uh, um, 15 uh, and beyond, verses 15 through, uh, I would say, read through, well, just read through the end of the chapter, read through 23. And Jesus uh, tells him, instructs him to feed his lambs, feed his sheep. So he gives them clear direction on what he's to do. Feed him with what? Feed him with the gospel. Feed him with the, the word of God. Feed him with the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. So in, in closing, I'm going to read the closing thought from our uh, Faith Pathway Adult Quarterly here with maybe a little commentary. Uh, Jesus' post-resurrection appearance to Peter and the other six, I should say, his, of his disciples on the shore of the Sea of Galilee was divinely orchestrated for three specific reasons. Number one, one was to teach them the necessity of obediently remaining in his will. So they demonstrated um, obedience in going to Galilee and waiting for him. Second, the second reason was to convince them that while he provides physical nourishment, he more importantly provides the necessary spiritual nourishment to encourage and empower believers to fulfill his call to serve him and others. He demonstrated that he had the power to provide for their physical and spiritual needs with this fellowship breakfast. And then finally, uh, Jesus demonstrated to these fearful, disobedient disciples that he is always available to forgive compassionately and restore his followers to complete fellowship with him. Now, uh, this makes reference to all of them forsaking him except for John during his crucifixion, his trial and crucifixion. And so we pray that God has given us um, a more clear understanding of this this le a third uh, recorded appearance of Lord Jesus to his disciples according to the Gospel of John and we pray that we would recognize that he is with us he, he said where two or three are gathered in my name there am I in the midst of us and we know the final uh, the commission the commission that the Lord left the church uh, and that he said he would be with us always even to the end of the age so as we go out and we evangelize the world baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. The Lord Jesus is with us in doing that. So we, we ask God's blessings upon all the hearers. Lord, Je Lord God, we thank you uh, again for this opportunity to study your word. And Lord, we, we thank you for the fellowship uh, that we have with you, Lord, when we are in your will and obedient to your word. We pray that you would help us to quickly confess and forsake sin and restore fellowship whenever it is broken, Lord. We pray that your perfect will, will be done in and through us. In your precious name, we pray. Amen.